Good morning. Um, my name is Claudine Sokol, and I work at the Nielsen Company. So many of you might have heard of the ratings. President Trump always likes to talk about ratings. So at the Nielsen Company, I actually got in there 23 years ago, and it was a very different uh, landscape, obviously. Uh, the Nielsen Company actually started off measuring uh, radio, and we have then obviously morphed into television. And today, it's really about content, right? So what we're talking about. So in my career working with television stations, advertisers, agencies, networks, and creators of content. And I kind of fell into that, and in the 23 years, it's really been looking across all areas, all ages, all times. I personally feel that I have my own survey, that's what we do, we do a lot of surveys, because I have four uh, teenagers or preteens, and believe me, I know how overload technology can be because all my children are developing humps from all the devices that they have which makes for a very lovely meal outside. Nobody really argues, but nobody's really listening to me either. So that's how I came to this. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Professor Mickey Kressbach. I'm in film, television, and media studies at SFTV. Um, I work primarily on apps and wearables, um, particularly through a kind of digital health lens. Um, I also teach a number of classes on emerging and digital media and have extensive conversations with you know, college-age students about the way they're using technology, um, how it's integrated into their everyday lives. Um, on a personal level, um, a lot of my work emphasizes using these technologies, particularly wearables. You may have noticed I'm wearing more than one wearable right now, um, right? So there's the sense that technology and the way that we're interacting with it is expanding through all of these different platforms and these different devices. So I'm trying to think like beyond the kind of emphasis on screens, right, to all of these new kind of technologies that permeate the everyday. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Joe Helligy. I'm professor of psychology at uh, Loyola Marymount University. Um, for much of my career, I did research on brain and behavior, especially left-right brain differences. And much of that was done when I was a professor at USC. One of my, my first brushes with modern technology was uh, working when I was vice provost there with the film school to create what is called the Multimedia Literacy Program which was to introduce undergraduate students uh, about the rules, laws, grammars of communicating with media outside of writing. Uh, most recently, since I moved to LMU, uh, I was uh, executive vice president and provost. I've returned to the classroom, which is my first love, and I'm teaching both a freshman seminar and senior seminar on the topic of brain, mind, and technology. So this is a topic that's become not only more important in the world, but of greater interest to me through my career. Okay. Good morning, my name is Jason Ablin. Uh, I've been in education now for about 30 years, and what's somewhat interesting about that is that I've seen the, almost the entire curve of integration of technology into schools. And uh, both on a personal level, uh, going f all the way back to the early 80s and watching technology in the form of, uh, you know, media labs and things like that, all the way through one-to-one -one technology, which I'll talk about later. Uh, so I've seen both students interact with technology, I've seen how schools are interacting with technology, and I've also seen how parents have been integrating with technology and how that has radically changed over the last 30 years as well. So there's been this huge generational wave that we've gone through. On a personal level, I also have two daughters, one who's now in college and uh, the other one who's an 11th grader. And that's another wave to go through of uh, experience how technology is used, uh, younger and younger, uh, as we've seen with children um, in, in educational settings. Uh, and I'm Mark Tritel. I Technology has always been super important to me. That's one of the reasons why I founded Techtainment. We co-founded Techtainment. And on a personal level, we are, uh, my oldest daughter, we just literally gave her a phone the past week. So we are in real time dealing with the issues of struggling with how much you should be giving uh, young adults the phone and how to deal with technology and managing those issues. Uh, one of the things that actually has come up is uh, how much screen time. So one of the, we asked, uh, we sent a survey yesterday to everyone, 
and we asked them what was the average daily screen time. So the responses were one to four hours were three people, five to eight, also three people, eight to 12, four people, and 12 plus hours was one person. As um, Claudine will explain after, talking about screen time includes other things besides your phone. But again, we're all friends here right now, so I'd like to know, you can close your eyes, raise your hands, how many, uh, if, you, uh, if you use between one to four hours, raise your hand. You can be honest, we're all friends here. Five to eight, there are hands raising up. Eight to 12, who's going to be the person that will admit they use 12 plus hours? Fantastic. I think this is something that we can all understand. Um, so Claudine uh, has been working at, um, at Nielsen for a long time, and why don't you give an overview of how people are spending their time using their devices? You can control it through the... Oh. Well, I, I guess you cannot. We have a technical difficulty. We'll have someone do it. So why don't you start speaking, and then we can... Sure. One of the biggest things we constantly get asked is you hear about all of these things taking time away from traditional television, growing up in the TV in the family room or the bedroom. Today, people are consuming content everywhere you go, right? Nobody talks to each other anymore. When you're in Starbucks, if you've got Wi-Fi, you're watching content. And that's what we've seen, is that there is an increase year over year in the amount of video that's coming through. Um, and you can see from this screen, it's a lot of pretty colors, but basically what you're seeing is that year over year, the top one is 2019, the bottom one is 2018, the blue reflects television, the dark blue is like time-shifted television, and the rest of them, the purple is audio, but the green, and then you go through the orange, reddish colors, that's video consumption on devices. That's tablets, that's smartphones, and that's other things. The thing that we're seeing is that people are spending more time watching video, spending time with their devices, or podcasts, as it will, for audio and radio, but what we're seeing is, it's just that they're using it at different times. So people aren't waiting to be at home after work or before work. You're getting consumption of, of content everywhere. People are doing it while they're on commute. If you're in a commuter market and you have access to Wi-Fi, as we present ourselves going to the 5G universe and Wi-Fi is more available free, thanks for the free password here, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that we have, if we've got 20 minutes, we can binge watch a show. If we've got you know, time to go, we do these things. And what we're seeing across the board is that it's just a question of how people are consuming and also at what age also influ influences how you consume. To that end, whether you are you know, older, this, this slide here will tell you by time spent by, day, by age during the day. So the first two columns are all people and then going across all the way to the left, you have the older groups. Younger people might not be watching as much. Oh, sorry, to the right. Younger people might not be watching as much content, but year over year, you can see they're gravitating more to that app or web on a smartphone. But that's also true for people as they get older as well. And we've also seen a phenomenon with older people with tablet devices, because it's, it's up close and they can control the, the size of the screen and such. So we've seen a huge adoption of these different types of devices and portable devices for people because you're no longer stuck watching where the TV's on the wall. Because if you have a Kindle or a tablet or a smartphone, you can watch anywhere in your home or any footprint. And that's what's really been the interesting change. It's not that people are watching less TV, it's they're watching more, but in non-traditional places. Well, I think you brought that up in our call about that there is no longer traditional family room. And maybe you can talk about that as the difference uh, as the society changes based on technology. Sure. I mean, I don't know about the rest of you. Again, I have four kids. Nobody will, will quote, chill out with me on the couch. I heard that was a bad thing to say. Um, but overall, what we've seen is People aren't doing the, you know, watching together because everybody has their niche programming. Or they're watching with their friends and they're talking to each other via social media as they're watching even though they're not in the same place. And so what we've seen is 
people are watching at home, but be, they don't have to watch in one place because they have choices, because everyone has that individual device. So we've seen kind of this like breakdown, unless it's like a major event, a major sporting event, uh, an Emmys or Academy Awards, or something really special, halftime on the sport, Super Bowl, they're not really watching together. The biggest impact we saw that was with the Twitter universe with the Game of Thrones phenomenon. When Red Wedding, that episode happened, it was like a shot went across the bow because everyone was on a big social couch going, oh my God, did you see what happened? So even though you might have been by yourself or whatever, suddenly you were part of this social phenomenon, but you were watching separately in your own home. So the idea of sitting at home in front of the TV for quality family time has kind of disintegrated with this explosion of personal devices. The average American household has 51 devices. Think about your, besides your own personal devices, think about your thermostat, think about your ring, think about the different apps, you, the smart speaker you have. Uh, it's just incredible. Before we get to Miki about the future of how we're watching, I'd like to ask a question, though. If you are advising a, a, a studio, uh, one of the streaming studios, and you see, this, uh, you see this data here that people are watching less, what would you say to them? Well, I, I, well, I think they're watching less traditional television, but I think the fact of the matter is, is that content still remains king. So as long as the content is evocative, as long as it's original, some of these things, whether it's a Netflix, which is subscription-based, or it's Warner Brothers or Universal, any of those places, they know that content is gonna be king if it's of value and they can push towards it. The issue becomes how to make better programming. It's like commercials. People will watch interesting commercials, right? You're gonna be engaged by them. Europe has these incredible award-winning commercials. They're risque, they're different. We didn't have that for a long time. And then when some people started skipping commercials, that's when we started seeing real outgoing commercials happen. Same thing with content. As long as there's content there that's evocative and different, kids will find it. And the word will get out through social media to go look for these. Most people, we, we release a streaming report every year, and we found that most people will stream or go to streaming content based on recommendations they've read about on their social media platforms. So studios, I'd say, besides your public PR team, get your social media team together and start trolling those influencers. That's, that's great uh, advice for everyone. Uh, Miki, you were going to be, you've been studying um, how people are using wearables and what the future is. Can you then take what Claudine is stating and saying where we're going? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to technological development specifically, but one of the ways in which a lot of these tech companies are trying to um, cut down on screen time is through wearable devices that are connected to your phone. So something like an Apple Watch and the way it sends your push notifications through vibration to that screen. Um, is an attempt to kind of cut down on those interactions with one's phone. And it's true, it definitely helps me cut down on my screen time. I have less than two hours a day, right, encountering my phone. And that's primarily because the bulk of my interactions with technology actually occur through these wearable devices. Now, you know, this is not necessarily the solution, right, but we're seeing a kind of movement um, perhaps to these other connected devices that communicate you with you in other ways than visual, right, other than kind of visual means, right? So with an Apple Watch, you're getting an increased attention to vibrations, right? With smart speakers, you might have a greater attention to kind of audio feedback. Um, and this is part of, right, the growing Internet of Things um, and the way that all of these kind of connected devices um, are populating our everyday lives um, and, in and increasingly drawing upon, right, not only visual interactions, but these kind of larger kind of sensory interactions, including um, sound and haptic feedback. Um, now, the question then becomes, like, is this the solution to too much time on one screen? Well. Um, and something that I talk about a lot with my students is like what happens, right, when your media becomes kind of ambient, right, and part of the kind of background of your everyday. Um, and then what happens is there's a kind of increased emphasis on the interruptions, right, that can emerge. Um, interruptions that are not just about the impulse to check your phone, right, but about the buzzing, right, on your wrist or the audio feedback you're getting from a smart speaker or, you know, some other connected technology. Um, so there's this kind of increased um, perhaps anxiety that kind of populates your everyday life as there's um, the possibility for more interruptions, um, but it can potentially, right, encourage folks to move away from their screens 
um, and be able to interact perhaps, you know, not necessarily through that interface. So we're kind of in this moment, I would say, of thinking about um, the way that technology, right, is encountered through multi-senses at this point, um, and how that might be shifting, right, our kind of everyday experiences of technology and the way we encounter them. But uh, depending, obviously the phone became ubiquitous, right? Everyone has, everyone right here has a phone in them, but not everyone has adopted the different wearables. And additionally, it doesn't seem, for example, there obviously was uh, with the iPhone and there was the, the Samsung, there hasn't really been a wearable that has caught on. Um, wouldn't that then push everything forward, or do you see that happening? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say because these technologies are hard to adopt, and they folks easily kind of throw them away. Um, the Apple Watch has become increasingly popular, and indeed, as these wearables become more attached to things like health and fitness um, in particular, they, they've allowed for a kind of increased adoption. So in 2019, I think wearables uh, were projected to be the um, like most profitable profiting uh, fitness craze, right, of 2019. Um, and I think that a lot, especially a company like Apple, is very much drawing on the language of health, right, to encourage folks to adopt this, right? Not only health with respect to our use of our screens, but, you know, conditioning a kind of healthy body. Um, so that seems to be, you know, a tactic that they're taking. And then the question of my research is, well, then what is the, our actual, like, what is the impact on the healthy body? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of debates around how positive, right, these, these wearable devices are for our physical and mental health. So as a professor, you encourage all your students to be wearing wearables. I encourage them to think critically. Like, I'm wearing this Fitbit right now because all my students have Fitbits for the next few weeks, and they're going to be experimenting with these technologies, and hopefully they're going to think critically about the positive and the negative effects of them. <laughs> and then just throw it back to Claudine. Is this something that Nielsen, if you can disclose, is they, are they measuring any of this use of wearables? Well, that's a great question. I'm um, Actually, um, we are... For our audio measurement and our television measurement in the top 44 markets, we've just in, uh, we're in the last edge of testing, excuse me, a wearable so people can be monitored in and out of the home, um, so that we can tell what they're listening and to what they're they're consuming media-wise, in home, out of home, regardless. So we're in the last testing of that. That is actually a wearable that looks a little bit like a Fitbit. And the number one question is, will it also count steps? And then, of course, it's a pendant or a clip-on or a fob. Um, but we are looking at, we work with health companies um, to talk about how frequently they're going to their sites and things, and are they being, being prompted. So that is one thing we have been talking about with um, our advertiser and some of our CPG clients, our consumer packaged goods clients, is how to utilize the fact that we're already in people's lives how can we help them through the adoption of these things? And what's the exposure? So we, we really just measure the exposure not the, and how people can activate more in terms of commercial success. But part of that comes into the research of how much is this part of our lives? How, because we do check each of our panelists. We have, you know, over 45,000 households across the U.S. besides the digital teams, finding out how, they, how much penetration there is of all of these devices. And that has just skyrocketed. Interesting. Um, so Joe, one of the main parts of our discussion is how does this affect us? We're all using, we're all using electronics. As we said, we went through, people are using it um, one to four, four to eight, 12 plus hours. How does this affect our brains? Well, give, us the, give us the gory details. <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, the brain is the brain. I mean, I don't want to, and I should disclose a couple of things. One is, I, I wear a Fitbit because my, one of my daughters gave it to me six years ago for Christmas. Um, I don't know that I've gotten hooked on it, but I want to talk a little bit in a minute about one aspect of where the brain comes in is dopamine and all of those things as part of our reward system and what we get rewarded for. I'm also not negative about, uh, about technology particularly. Um, it can be used for wonderful things. It can be used uh, for things that aren't so good. But keep in mind that our brains have evolved to make us the only species on the planet that can collaborate flexibly with thousands, if not millions of people, most of whom we don't know. We are highly social creatures. 
And so what happens with technology, and sometimes people express a fear that if it's a child, an adult, and you're overusing technology and media in a certain way, you're sitting alone, you're lacking social interactions with people. Um, but that's not true. We're highly social beings. And so I can watch my nine-year-old grandson playing Fortnite on his iPad, and he's online with two of his friends uh, talking back and forth, not so differently from the way I used to sit in person with my friends and play all kinds of games. So uh, can, in fact, media uh, of that sort be isolating? Sure. But when you look at the research studies, there are certain questions you have to ask yourself. A lot of the studies are correlational studies. If you see, for example, that uh, and that there's higher use of certain kinds of media or certain kinds of screen time in people who suffer from social anxiety, well, what's the cause and what's the effect? Is it the social media causing social anxiety, or do people who have social anxiety gravitate towards modes of interaction with which they're more comfortable? So when you start looking at relationships between brain function and technology, uh, it's pretty complicated, and so you, you need to dissect the studies uh, fairly carefully. Uh, just a few words about, um, about reinforcement. Um, I guess that most of us have a hard time resisting, whether it's a vibration or an auditory signal, we have a hard time resisting a notification. And most of us know the story of Pavlov's dogs, right? Dogs are trained to, uh, to salivate to a tone which has been paired with a meat stimulus. You also, we all learned about skin, rats or pigeons in Skinner type boxes where responses are made to get a reward. Well, guess what? The, the type of reinforcement schedule that produces the highest response rate is not when you get a reward every time. It's when you intermittently get a reward and you don't know whether this is going to be a reward trial or not. So you get a notification. You don't know if it's, a, if it's something really good, something juicy, something really boring. And every once in a while, you're reinforced with something that really gives you great pleasure. And it is no wonder, therefore, that uh, we have a strong tendency to respond to these things. And then you can do what I do and you turn your notifications off. Well, guess what? The passage of time serves as a kind of signal. Oh, I haven't checked my phone in the last seven minutes. I better look at the screen and see what I'm missing. And so this fear of missing out is really a powerful thing. And it's built around all of the, what we know about the brain and reinforcers and the same mechanisms that are involved in any kind of other behavior we engage, we engage in. And the final thing is let's keep in mind, we use these media because we like them. This isn't 1984 where Big Brother forces it upon us. We use these things because we like to do it. They are on the whole, reinforcing. If they weren't reinforcing and constructed in a way to take advantage of our cognitive biases, our, particularly our emotional biases, we wouldn't be using them. So uh, we're stuck with them. And so the question for me isn't, you know, how to mitigate the bad effects. It's really how is this changing the way that we interact with one another? How is this changing the way we learn about the world, whether it's in a classroom or on the internet as we're trying to figure out how to, how to erase things from our DVR without erasing everything we've ever recorded? But talking ab uh, about those um, psychological effects, for example, if someone is more conducive to Maybe this analogy isn't so great, but if someone's more conducive to being an alcoholic and then you're putting them around alcohol. So are there, have there been studies about people that can't control their impulses and then therefore are very suscept susceptible to overuse of electronics technology and such? Um, I don't know of specific studies that have looked at that in a, in a really deep way. I mean, it, it certainly is true that different ones of us, whether it's media or chocolate or anything else, different ones of us are differentially susceptible uh, to things. And 
yes, there is always likely to be a segment of the population that overuses it. What we know with alcohol, for example, that we don't know about media is we know that there are genetic predispositions to alcoholism. There may be other kinds of genetic ca characteristics that make it more or less likely that a person will become, quote, addicted to certain kinds of social media, but we're really far from, from knowing it and understanding it. Um, and so, yes, I think whether it's media or other things, there are always segments of the population that will react in a way that most of us would consider unhealthy or not productive. I don't know that it casts aspersions on the media itself or the other, or alcohol itself, or the things that are the, the, the immediate stimulus for the person's overindulgence. Okay, well we'll definitely get back to those issues. I think they're the main issues we're discussing. Uh, Jason, as an educator, you spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And beyond the theoretical, how is technology affecting children? And have you seen over the years different ways technology was used and misused? And additionally, can you explain the history of integration of technologies in schools? So I'll, I'll actually work backwards from the question. I'll start with the history a little bit. And the history goes back uh, probably to the early 80s with the first computer labs inside of schools. And basically the assumption was that kids were learning technical skills and this was a positive thing and it, was, it seemed like a, such a small isolated moment in education that there wasn't really a lot of energy around it. With the advent of uh, the internet, that really changed everything. That was the game changer. The other big game changer was that uh, computers and devices started to come out of the labs. In other words, that by uh, the late 80s, early 90s, Australia was already, based on the writings of Seymour Paparit, were, was already integrating one-to-one -one programs into schools. They were really the first country on the cutting edge of this. And then by 1994, which I remember really well, there seemed to be this shift in the conversation. It was no longer if, it was when and how. The, the, just the question of whether technology was going to be in schools disappeared. There was no debate anymore. It was just, it was just considered to going to be uh, a commonplace event. And between 1999 and really 2016, I implemented in schools as a leader four one-to-one -one programs in schools, in different schools, both with laptops and iPads. And so, ironically, what's happened is that schools were really one of the first places where there's a, some, an assumption, one-to-one -one program is defined as everyone in the building has a personal relationship to a device. That's what it literally is defined as. So, ironically, schools were really on the cutting edge of this idea that everyone should own a device and have their own device. And, and that was gonna be the best way to use technology effectively in schools with children. And I saw it get younger and younger. First it was high school, then they decided it would be a good idea to bring into middle school, and then elementary school, then early childhood programs. I mean, it just, the phenomenon was, was accelerated very, very quickly. Um, in 2011, the first iPad came out, right? It's, it's 2019, 2020, it was only eight years ago, nine years ago. By, in 2012, I went to my first iPad conference in the United States for educators. There were 900 of us there, mostly from the United States. By 2013, there were 3,500 of us at this conference, and we were from 50 different countries. So it just, the acceleration of integration of technology into schools has been uh, almost, uh, we have not kept up with it well as noticed by what happened in the LAUSD system. And particularly, I mean, there were districts that were going out, Hawaii in one year bought a million iPads, you know, for the state of Hawaii. You know, that's, that was kind of the thinking about this. So what really got very confusing very quickly was the uh, relationship and interaction between education, the marketplace, and the new marketplace of the internet, which was all getting mixed into this conversation. 
uh, one of the big issues that parents had originally with technology, especially with the internet, was the first question was about predators. That was the first wave of concern by parents. And it raised an enormous uh, industry around safety. So school safety, child safety, how should schools handle it? That was the first issue on the table. Uh, and for the most part, that was really a perceptual issue. That was not a reality. That was a perceptual issue of what was going on. The next wave was about usage because there was a generation of parents who did not grow up with the technology and they were, you know, digital natives versus uh, digital immigrants. So there was this whole discussion between kids knowing much more about the technology than they did and parents having to catch up. Now in schools, that divide has disappeared. Parents are as frequent users of technology as their children. And so those kind of questions have now disappeared as well, I found in schools. Parents are not questioning as much how much time their kids are using media. It seems just okay to this generation of parents that their kids are on media a lot. Um, and, and that's been kind of the history of how things have gone. Some of the challenge you me challenges you've mentioned about, about integrating technology into schools has really been a question of leadership. And one of the questions has been that when schools have been allowed and the faculties and leadership of schools have been allowed to integrate technology into schools with a kind of philosophy and thinking about technology, which is not about technology, but it's about the education, that's where we see all of the incredible success stories about technology in schools. And I've seen unbelievably creative work by students, by faculty members working with students, just extraordinary things when you allow the professionals to do what they're supposed to do inside of schools with these highly creative and interesting kids who really, really uh, uh, gravitate towards learning. There's, um, there's the advent of souls, which are these, uh, you know, uh, self-organizing learning environments, which are now popular inside of schools. And so there's all kinds of interesting work going on. When it goes bad is when from on high, the schools are told what to do with technology. And then all of a sudden, when you have districts and when you have big school systems trying to dictate how, how schools are using technology, it usually goes very bad very fast, and it feels like there's been an enormous amount of resources wasted in this field. Uh, kids among themselves, they still take the direction of educators in this realm. They're still taking the, they're waiting for us to tell them how to use this well in education. So it's really super important that educators are well trained and really trusted to do the creative kind of work inside of schools with kids, uh, with technology. The impact in terms of usage, I'm not exactly sure if we have control over any of that. As administrator, for at least the past 15 years, I have been consistently dealing with issues of discipline and foggy areas about digital bullying, about issues of how kids are talking to other kids over social media, how they're using social media. Parents always want us to intervene. They always want us to intervene. And often what they're, kind of, what they're doing is they're offloading on us a lot of the issues that are going on with their kids, regardless of whether the technology was there or not. What I will say, as a, just a final thought about this, is that when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, technology is very, very appealing. And one of the reasons which Joe was, was mentioning is that it's really lonely being 12, 13, and 14 years old. It can be a very lonely space. You're growing up, you're forming identity, you don't know, you know, your relationships are, are, are amorphous and constantly moving and changing. Technology provides a great deal of safety inside of the social environment for kids, and they gravitate to it. I'm not judging it, I'm not making a judgment about it, but I do know what the experience is like being a 13-year-old, I've been around them enough. And, and technology does fill that void for a lot of them. Well, let's kind of follow up with that, um, because one thing as a parent 
the, the main thing you hear as a parent is the words, I'm bored. And that goes into what uh, Joe, Joe was stating. And basically, technology is being used because it's an easy way to alleviate boredom. Um, what, and companies, I think, as we understand, are utilize that, right? They're providing something. What do you, and let's open up to the entire panel, what do you think the ethics of uh, companies knowing that people in depressed states generate interest in the products? Anyone? Um, well, I mean, I assume that's what companies are supposed to do. Um, and, so, and so I don't think it's horrible. I mean, I want, I, I think I want companies to create products that I want to use. And so I, I don't want people to stop doing that. Now I think the question, the, the question of, of ethics, I don't know, it gets to be complicated because, because is it unethical, for example, for a company to use the best of what we know about psychology and brain science to create a product that people are going to get hooked on. Um, I don't know that it's unethical. I suppose you know you could you could say that it's unethical if what you're trying to hook people on is somehow known to be bad for them. But uh, I'm not sure how you know that you know in in advance. So uh, I, I think the ethics question is, is is it's a tricky question, and it may it may depend on someone's judgment about whether what you are hooking people into is a good thing or a bad thing. My own sense of a lot of where we are with, with different kinds of media is, uh, is kind of neutral. We don't know whether it's good or bad, uh, partly because we don't have the data and partly because it depends on how the users use it, which is terribly hard to predict in advance. I mean, take you know what Jason was just saying about uh, 12, 13, 14 year olds, uh, some find it socially comfortable to be able to interact using media and not always have to do it face to face. But then, and, and so suppose you're a company and you create a really nice platform to make that possible. But is it your responsibility then as a company when some decide to use that to do a very vicious kind of bullying? And so the ethical question gets to be tricky uh, with respect to who's responsible for what kind of behavior. Understood, and, and that also goes back, I mean, one of the, uh, the videos that I had, uh, we had circulated before, uh, one of the points was that, about the hook, and we talked about this before, about the reward and the anticipation of the reward. And one way of looking at, uh, which I had never thought of, um, which was when we look at our social media feed, it is a treasure hunt. And it basically says, you know, you look at Twitter and the first, um, the first thing would be something that's not interesting, the second one would be not interesting. But the third is really interesting, so you continue down that feed. And that is how our brains are working. And it was really interesting to kind of like take a step back and say, okay, this is why I enjoy going on Twitter, because you want to see, you want to find that hunt. One of the, uh, we can all discuss that, but one of the points is, is it's not the actual, it's the anticipation of finding that next interesting thing versus the actual finding of it. Can everyone also elaborate? Well, I, I, there's definitely that, that, that high you get when you find something or a great, I love the videos that I find because I didn't even know about Carpel Coke karaoke unit first came out, and then I saw it, someone had shared it on social media, and then I was totally hooked about this guy in a Range Rover around West LA, or at, near the, the Grove, running around, and wanted to like stalk out there to see who the new star was. Um, but I wanted to talk about something else. My company actually studies, we have a neuroscience division that actually studies how people react to videos and branding because one of the things that's happening is that as people are consuming content, these companies are realizing they can hook people by just adding certain verbiage, certain sites and things to their brand. 
but the way they're offsetting the fact that they're, they're stimulating people's dopamine in their brain is now you've discovered this whole company is with this, like their social or their environmental supporting, you know, the Tom's shoes. You'll feel good because when you buy a pair of expensive canvas shoes, <laughs> some kid will have a pair of canvas shoes or the Bombas or things like that. So I think that, you know, we see that a lot is that companies, honestly, most companies just want to raise the bottom line, so they're not really as aware of that. What is happening is that younger generations, because I think of media and exposure, don't have the same level of brand loyalty anymore. So what you're seeing is, is that companies before would be that target in media is 2554. That's no longer the case. They're trying to switch your loyalties constantly. And that's a big change that's happened because if they can get you to think, oh, I'm gonna feel good about myself by buying this, I feel good about buying a clean product because I'm not sending ocean, plastic into the ocean, and my, little, my, my kids who are learning in school about you know, recycling and everything else, they'll, you'll switch loyalties now. So it's changed how we consume what we consume. I, just about the boredom question. Um, you know, also with tech, people who engage in technology, we call them users, right? I mean, that's the language we use. That's, uh, that's pretty revealing language about how we consider what technology is. Uh, the other piece is, and I'm just gonna speak from personal experience, I've had my kids come up to me and tell me that they're bored, and I've had kids in school come up to me and tell me that they're bored. I tell them, you're not bored, you're boring. <laughs> and I kind of mean that, in the sense that if, if your experience is so narrow and you do not, you are not developing multiple interests, even if they are in the digital space, even if they are in the digital space, that's the issue, and again, it's not about technology, as Joe was mentioning. That's about, I think, the normal processes of trying to figure out who you are and really what your interests are and what you're passionate about and what you want to be doing in the world. Can I piggyback on that? Um, I actually want to counteract this a little bit and say that you know the issue is not that they need to explore more activities, but that boredom is actually good and can be a really positive experience. Um, I know, and maybe Joe can speak more to this, that there have been scientific studies on, you know, the as boredom as a way of recharging, basically. Um, and the question that I debate with my students is, are they bored on the internet or are they wasting time on the internet? And the distinction between these two kinds of experiences. Time wasting might be more attributed to cycling through like the YouTube suggested list, right? Something like that. Versus being bored where you're like, kind of utterly befuddled in that moment. And the magical thing about boredom, when you do encounter it, especially in online spaces, is it often forces you to kind of reflect back on your experience in that platform, right? To think critically about like, why is it that I'm bored in this moment? So I think that, you know, actually sometimes encouraging boredom with technology um, can be a positive way to get young people in particular to reflect on the structures of the technology and also their experiences and encounters with them. Okay, I'm gonna do a little Black Mirror here. I had an interesting question. So Black Mirror is the kind of the uh, twilight zone that's dark. So as we just saw in the last week um, regarding vaping, right? You basically had something where there were a bad health effects and then all of a sudden government very quickly reacts. So let's give a Black Mirror where there basically is a technology or a website which starts harming people. Can government then regulate that? Well, isn't the role of government part of taxes to protect from, from an outside danger? Just like if you had a chemical explosion or you had a, a war or anything else like that. If there is a, a site or something on the internet that is causing harm, and that, that's not an objective, it's just harming to children. Like for example, you know, I was very against my children watching 13 Reasons Why and I found out how useless my passwords and my security measures were at that point. I have four burgeoning hackers in my home. But one of the things I was very upset about, I felt that was harming. And there was a lot of outcry for that. But to your point, Dark Mirror, if there's something out there that is just dark web harming and causing kids, whether it's to do stupid tricks or you know, jumping off and trying to emulate things they see on YouTube videos, yeah, I think that there is a point where you step in and, you know, it's like the old Supreme, I'm saying this to a bunch of lawyers, great. The old Supreme Court issue, I know pornography when I see it. I know harm when I see it. Right. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, different people will have different views about the role of government, but there certainly are precedents, whether it's, well, right now we're seeing, you know, what's the government's role going to be in vaping and, and flavored vaping? I mean, the issue of where government might or might not step in, I don't think is unique to technology. But one thing I wanted to sort of pick up on uh, from earlier is this notion that now we are consuming things like video media on all kind of different and individualized platforms. One of the things that, that couldn't happen when everybody sat together and watched is that even if the TVs had been smarter and Nielsen had been sneakier, you were able to listen in on the conversations and so forth and pick up something about that family and then figure out how to use it. Uh, what you couldn't do, but what you can do now, is with people on their individual media, uh, you start to get access to things about that person. And you start to know not just about what they've watched on the video, but you don't know what those apps are doing. You don't know what agreements you've signed. You don't know what else it's able to access, for example, on your phone or on your iPad. And so suddenly, we're carrying these things around, watching what really are older forms of video stories and programs and things, but we're doing it individually. And, and if you combine wearables, and suddenly you've got a wearable that monitors your blood pressure and your heart rate, you have the potential for uh, sophisticated algorithms to know almost more about you than you know about yourself. I mean, you know how you feel, but your heart rate or, or uh, your breathing rate may have given away how you're going to feel a few seconds before you even knew it yourself. And so I think that creates a whole interesting set of questions too. Uh, I suppose you could go down the government intervention path and say, well, is there going to be a role for government in somehow regulating these technologies that, that know us so well? But they'll know when we're bored. Before and sometimes we know when we're bored. So I, I think there's an element to this that yes, our brains are gonna know things about ourselves because my wearable tells me what my heart rate is. Am I in my target zone? Am I not in my target zone? Well, even my crude little primitive Fitbit that was the earliest generation of Fitbit knows where I've walked, how, how many steps I've walked, and how much more sophisticated, I mean, there was a story about a year ago where a murder was solved because the victim was wearing a Fitbit and it showed where she was, which was not where the person who killed her said she was at the time. I mean, we're living in, we're turning ourselves over quite willingly and happily in most cases because we're not just users, we're products. Um, I wanted to open up uh, questions if there are any. We have many questions here, but if you would like to ask something of our panelist. Yes, Cynthia, Cynthia Cohen. See, I know, I know every single person's name. I'm, I'm, the names are digitally banged into my glasses right now. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the Nielsen ratings and the people who you follow and how they are selected. Oh, it's totally random. So it's, uh, it's completely random. We collect um, from every single market in America, and we create, it's proprietary how we create the markets. And then within the markets, we um, have, especially today, we have to get cell phone numbers and addresses, and then we go out and we have teams locally that recruit them in person in our top markets. And then uh, last year, we converted 137 of the smaller markets, which is we're using panels in those markets we recruited, but as well as electronic data from set-top box data from cable and satellite providers. Okay, we are almost out of time, but I did have kind of uh, lightning round questions for the panel. Um, very quick, two-part question. What is the a famous technology that you do not, that you never use, and what is your favorite time killer app? Quick, Jason. Uh, so, never, never used Instagram. Never used it, just don't, don't interact with it at all. And my favorite app, or my, just my time favorite? Time killer app. Time killer app is still a tried and true Facebook. Tried and true Facebook. Uh, 
so many that I don't use. I have very few apps on my phone, my iPhone 5, so you can see where, where I'm at in this space. Um, I suppose it's not an app, but my favorite probably is email. I'm not boring. Okay. Miki? I adapt most technology. Um, <laughs> I would say I'm not a big Twitter user, surprisingly, um, and my favorite app is probably Instagram. I can't figure out Snapchat. I, I've tried every filter. My kids say I suck at it, so I don't know how to tell you that. And I think my fa favorite one is Poshmark. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for me to end, uh, though I never use Instagram, and the one that was my favorite, I mean, is, is twi uh, Twitter and Facebook, which I actually deleted from my phone. Thank you very much. We now have a 10-minute break.